A friend of mine posted two pictures side by side on his social media page. On one side was a picture of his rear driver's side tire. It had gone flat on him. On the other side, Darius, was a picture of his spare tire that he had now placed in the place of his flat one. He wrote the following words in his post. Shout out to my dad for teaching us how to solve our own problems. Change my tire in 15 minutes instead of waiting on Mr. Rescue. My father taught me and my siblings how to change a tire as well. And I will venture to say, those of you in the building and those of you watching me online, that someone in your life, mother, father, uncle, aunt, probably taught you the same thing. You know, I'm not sure that at the time that my friend uh, was taught by his dad how to change a tire, uh, if he saw that as being relevant for his life at the time. If you're like me, when my dad taught me first how to change a tire, I didn't think uh, that it was that relevant for my life. Why do I need to learn how to change a flat, dad? And he said, well, son, you never know. One day you may need to know this skill set on how to change your own tire. The truth of the matter is, I don't know what my friend thought about his dad first teaching him that lesson, but I can guarantee you that years later, when he had that flat a couple of weeks ago or a couple of days ago, he, he appreciated his father teaching him that lesson on how to change his tire. Today's passage is similar to that. You and I may not see the relevance of what Paul is teaching in this text now, but we will come to appreciate it if we ever have a blow up, if we ever have a dispute, if we ever have a grievance against a fellow Christian, particularly within the context of our local church family. This lesson that Paul teaches us will come in handy if we are ever asked, for example, by a brother or sister in the Lord to give our take on a blow up or on a dispute that they have or a grievance that they have with a fellow Christian and how they ought to go about handling it. So don't, don't, don't tune this passage out just because it may not necessarily apply to you uh, in the present because you never know when a blow up will occur either in your life or in the life of somebody else between another fellow believer. So this is one of those Passages where I think you just need to kind of stick this in your, in your back pocket, put it in your purse, put it in your wallet for future reference. In today's passage, I believe Paul gives us three ways on how we ought to deal with civil grievances that we may have with one another. Three ways he gives us on how we ought to deal with civil grievances that exist or may happen with one another. Here's the first way. Christians should not go before non-Christian judges to adjudicate their civil disputes against one another. Christians should not go before non-Christian judges to adjudicate their civil disputes against one another. If you have a Bible still open, it's right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Paul says, when one of you has a grievance against another, listen to his question, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous? When you look at this in the original language, Paul actually begins that first verse with saying, dare you do this? Paul is saying the nerve of some of you to take your grievance that you have with a fellow believer in your local church before an unrighteous judge. It appears 
that the nature of these disputes or grievances that existed among the church between certain believers were civil. And I get this from the repetitive Greek word Paul uses in verse 3 and verse 4. He uses this Greek word, biotika. It means ordinary matters or matters pertaining to daily life. So it seems that the issues that believers were in dispute over were not grave criminal offenses that should be brought before the court of law. Did you catch that? What Paul is dealing with here, what the church of Corinth was dealing with here, is that they were not dragging each other into court for grave criminal offenses, offenses like murder or molestation or burglary. Now, Paul doesn't go into detail as it relates to what type of civil disputes were going on among the church at Corinth. That, though that be the case, some scholars suggest that it was probably could have been financial in nature due to Paul using the word defraud in verse 7. But obviously, he didn't have to spell it out for them because the Corinthian believers knew exactly the kind of issues he was referring to when he wrote this letter. But for our sake today, civil disputes among us in the 21st century might look like this. A civil dispute between us could look like a disagreement over what you should pay for someone running an errand for you, for example. You have a situation where a brother or sister runs an errand for you. They, you ask them to go and get a couple of things from the store for you and because maybe you are not able to do it, maybe you're, 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 you're busy with something or maybe that's the pandemic that's going on and you don't want to get out of your house. And so you ask a brother or sister, hey, do you mind going to the store for me and picking up a couple of items? And so they go to the store. Uh, they decide to go get your groceries and those groceries total up to $50. And then um, they decide when they came back, to your house, they said, oh, yeah, the, the groceries cost $50, and, you know, because of my gas usage, um, it's, you know, that's, that's probably going to be about $15. Uh, so that's $65 in total. But you disagree. You see, you disagree because you were kind of tabulated it already how much these groceries were going to cost. You said, you know, that that these groceries shouldn't have cost you but $30. I mean, I sent you to the grocery store to get, like, beef, ground beef. I, I didn't send you to get Wagyu beef. Who, who sent you to get Wagyu beef? You could have got 80-20, right? You could I, I would 80-20, you know, uh, lean and fat. I, you could have got some, some, some unbrand, some, some store brand, you know, version of some ground beef. But you ain't nobody, I didn't tell you to buy Wagyu beef. So, so that, I don't know where you get $50 from, Danny, but that's, that's $30, you know, according to my, you know, computation. That, that's, that's $30. And where do you get this whole $15 from? Like, where did you go? Like, like I didn't tell you, you the Tom Thumb would have sufficed. You went to the Walmart in Cedar Hill. I didn't tell you to go to the Walmart in Cedar Hill. There was a Tom Thumb right here in DeSoto that you could have driven to or drove to, and all of this would have shouldn't have only cost you about, it should have only cost me about $35. You get the point? How it's easy for these disputes to arise among us. Here's another example. How about this one, that you let a fellow believer drive your car. What if, what if you let a person who's a believer in your church drive your car and you tell them, hey, you know, good, I know you got to run a couple of errands or whatever you're doing, feel free to take my car. The next day or two, when you go out to your car, you see that you have a flat tire. So you call that brother or sister up who you allowed to borrow your car and you say, hey, bro, hey, sis, my tire is flat. I'm going to need you to replace it. It's going to cost about $250. And then you say, $250? <laughs> say, Man, where you get that tire at? Like, like you do know um, you don't need Pirelli's on the Prius, right? I mean, 
So y'all don't know, some of y'all may not know what Pirellis are, but they're very expensive tire. You drive a Prius, sister. <laughs> why, why are you putting Pirellis? Because that's, you know, that, that must be a Pirelli because that, that, that tire costs entirely too much. And so you say, listen, listen, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can afford that. Plus, how do you know that the tire went flat on when I was driving it? Like, maybe there was a nail that was already in the tire, and you just didn't notice it. And, and you know, so, so but, but we don't have to argue about that. But listen, I'll go half with you on a baseline Achilles tire or a Goodyear All Seasons Assurance tire. But then y'all can't come to an agreement because now this dispute has arisen among you. Or how about this situation? And again, you, got, you have various situations, but I'm giving you examples of what civil disputes might look like among us. What about if you um, tell a brother or sister in the Lord um, that you can borrow something from you? That they, it, they can borrow this from you. So you say to him or her, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get it back to you. Uh, or that person says to you, I'll get it back to you as soon as I'm finished with it. And then you say, oh, no, you got it. No worries. Take your time. That was months or years ago. And she still, he still has not returned it. So you say one day, hey, you know, you remember that item I let you borrow a while ago? But can I have it? Can I have it back, please? Borrow? Man, what you talking about? Oh, you talking about that book, that curling iron, that uh, those shoes, that wig? <laughs> I thought you said that was mine. You look at him and say, "Come on, bro. Come on, sis. You know that's not what I meant. I, I said that it, it was okay. You got it. I didn't mean you got it as you can have it." You know what I meant. And they say, well, no, I, I, I didn't think that's what you meant, but it's whatever. Yeah, I'll get it back to you. That was months <laughs> and years ago. Now you have a civil dispute situation on your hands. You get the picture here? Paul says these judges that you are taking your civil matters to he says, the reason why you don't need to take them to them, for, for one, he says in verse 6, look, look at me there, at the end of verse 6, he says, you are taking them before unbelieving judges. They're unbelievers. These judges do not believe in the person and work of Jesus. They do not believe in the gospel of Jesus. They do not believe in the good news of Jesus, that he came, that he lived the perfect life for us, that he died on the cross for our sins, and that he was raised from the dead so that we might be forgiven by God and brought back into a right relationship with God. Paul is saying these judges don't even believe in Jesus, and yet you're taking your civil dispute before them. But number two, that's not all he says about them. In verse 4, he says that these judges have no standing in the church. Or some translations say that they, that they are despised or not looked upon favorably or have any merit when it comes to the church. He's saying they're not a part of the church. They're not a part of your church, not a part of any church. They don't have any merit when it comes to the church, Chris. They don't have any standing when it comes to the church, and yet you're going to unbelieving, non-attending, non-members of churches to hear your case and to judge your case. But that's not it. The third thing Paul points out about these judges, about these lawyers, is in verse 9 and 10. He says that these judges have no stake in the kingdom of God. It's right there, verse 9, he says, or do you not know that the unrighteous, did you see that? It connects with the, the word back in verse 1. He says, you take this before the law, before the unrighteous. He's saying they, the, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you're taking it before these judges who have no eternal inheritance in the kingdom of God. In other words, they have no share in the eternal reign, rule, and realm of the kingdom of God. 
if they are not citizens of God's kingdom, Paul says, through faith in King Jesus, he says, therefore, why are you recognizing their authority when they don't recognize the authority, the court, the rules of our God? And what makes you think that it's okay for you to seek them out then to handle your disputes when they don't even abide and they don't know God and they don't abide by God's law, his word? But that's not all, he says. He gives a fourth characteristic, Tracy, of these judges. He says, you are taking your civil disputes before, look with me in verse 1, I already showed it to you, unrighteous judges. Now, the reference here is not only to their spiritual state of lostness. It is not only some, most scholars, some scholars believe that this is not only saying, it's not a, just a synonym for unbeliever, but that unrighteous also has a moral um, connotation to it. That these judges are not judging and have a reputation of judging unfairly and judging in a way that does not please God. Oftentimes, if you study Corinth and, and the city of Corinth and the judges and the court system and the legal system of that day, it was known, not in all cases, but it was fairly a well-known proposition that these judges could be bribed and would be bribed to rule in the favor of the one who paid for their judgments. It was, it was known in Corinth for these judges and lawyers to, to be unrighteous in their judging duties. One author called them gowned vultures. As David Garland writes in his commentary on this passage, Paul expresses disgust that someone in the church had the audacity to take a quarrel with a fellow Christian to be adjudicated by unbelievers who, if they were not outright knaves and scoundrels, were hardly paragons of impartiality and justice. Verse 5, Paul says, you ought to be ashamed of yourselves. You see it there? I say this to your shame. Now, I, I must say, if you like me and you pay attention to our culture, brothers and sisters, shame uh, is not in vogue. Shame is actually despised in our culture. It is labeled, shame is, as toxic or unhealthy, that nobody should ever feel ashamed of what they do. But ungodly or godly shame is a good thing. Godly shame brings us to accept the conviction of the spirit. Godly shame leads us to repent of sin before God. So, so though shame may not be uh, in vogue in the culture, shame, godly shame that is, not condemnation, but godly shame over what we are doing in terms of sinful activity and sinful behavior is something that all Christians should embrace. You be careful, and I say this as, as, a, as a parenthetical thought, be careful when you stop feeling shame over ongoing sin in our lives and in your life and in mine. Because that's, that means you are in a bad spiritual condition when you don't feel convicted, when you don't feel any shame related to what you are doing, when what you are doing goes, to clear the, goes against the clear directives of the Word of God. So the first, first way that Paul says if, that he wants us to deal with civil disputes is he says, don't take your civil disputes to non-Christian judges for them to adjudicate those disputes that you have amongst one another. Here's the second way. Paul says we need to handle, deal with these civil grievances that we may have with one another. Christians should solicit the help of their local church to help settle their civil disputes against one another. Mm -hmm. Christians should solicit the help of their local church to help settle their disputes amongst or against one another. 
Now, obviously, we're talking about members of the same church here. He's talking about the church at Corinth. These are members of the same local church. Paul builds his case, if you will, as to why believers should, why we should bring our civil disputes to the saints or to fellow believers or to the church. He builds his case by posing two overarching questions. The first one is in verse 2. Why should you bring your civil disputes to the church so that the church can help you mediate this situation? Verse 2, he says, because the saints are going to judge the world. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, some scholars see this as a reference to the millennial reign of Christ and the saints participating with Christ in ruling the world, according to Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, along with the apostles, and they have an exercising of their special authority to judge the 12 tribes of Israel, according to Matthew chapter 19, verse 19, verse 28. Other scholars believe that the way in which we, the saints, will judge the world with Christ will be in the sense that we will, like the good angels give assent or approval of Jesus' judgment of the world. This is what is based on Revelation chapter 16, verses 5 and 6. Paul says, the reason why you should bring your disputes to the church, civil disputes, is he says, do you not know that the church is going to actually judge the world? He says, but that's not it. Let me pose a second question to you, verse 3. He says, do you not know that we are going to judge angels? Now, if we understand the Greek word krino here to mean judgment, then scripture is clear that God will at the end of all things judge fallen angels. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, Jude 6, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, intimate this idea that God is the one who will judge fallen angels. And so some scholars believe that our role in judging fallen angels is simply us affirming the Lord's judgment against fallen angels. But some interpret this word krino to mean to rule or to govern, which could be the sense here. And if it means that, then it means that, that, that we're going to have uh, some role in ruling over uh, the angels, not necessarily fallen angels, but in this case, it would be the holy angels angels. But hear this, regardless of all of that, we can't really be dogmatic as to what this judging or ruling that Paul speaks about is going to look like. The nature of this judgment or ruling over angels is not given to us in detail in the scripture. As R.C.H. Linsky says in his commentary here on 1 Corinthians, he says, in what this judging consists In promulgating or confirming the verdict or in otherwise assisting, we must leave until the great act actually takes place. There are some things that Paul says here that we don't are not given uh, details about, but we won't we'll only know what it will look like when that day actually comes. But what Paul is doing here, y'all, is let's not don't get caught up in the trees to where you miss the forest. What he's doing here is he's arguing from the greater to the lesser. Listen to what his words are. He says, and if the world is to be judged, verse, this is verse uh, 2, and if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Greater to lesser. If you're going to judge the world, that's a great thing then how are you not able to judge trivial matters on earth? He's arguing or bringing the argument from greater to lesser. He says again, verse 3, how much more then matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, he says, 
He says, why, uh, verse 3, do you not know that we ought to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Do you see he is moving the argument from greater to lesser? He's saying you're going to be given this, this unanimous, this significant, rather, role of judging the world and angels with Christ over here. And if you're going to be given that responsibility and that honor of ruling with Christ and reigning with Christ over the world and over fallen angels then can't you handle these civil disputes that's going on amongst y'all? Do you get Paul's point here? David Garland is, again, helpful here. He writes, the argument, Tim, moves from the greater to the lesser. If they are destined, if we are destined, he says, if they are destined to be participants in the celestial judgment of the world and of the angels, they, that is the church, ought to be able to handle mundane matters of far less consequence. Paul continues. Verse 5, look, look, there, look there with me. Can it be, he says, that there is no one among you wise enough? To settle a dispute between brothers? I mean, after all, after all, y'all have been boasting about how, how wise y'all are as a church, about how spiritual y'all are as a church, about how gifted you are as a church, about how spiritually skilled you are as a church. If you're so wise, is there not one of y'all, at least one of you in the church, that can help settle this issue between believers? says there should be at least one who can arbitrate, who can mediate this issue. So Paul says, listen, you ought to bring your civil disputes to the church because the church has a greater role that we will play in eternity with Christ, and we should be able to handle these civil matters that occasionally occur among us. You shouldn't have to go to a judge to handle this issue about who borrowed what from who. You shouldn't have to go to a, a judge, an unrighteous judge, to, to, to come to an agreement on how you're going to take care of this flat tire. Are y'all tracking where Paul is? These are civil small disputes. Why are you going to sue one another when this should be taken care of amongst the church? I wish we would, I wish we would, <laughs> I wish we would take Paul's Holy Spirit inspired directives here. And maybe we, but we wouldn't have so many um, litigation stuff going on amongst the church. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I, I don't want to, because it's public, I don't know if any of y'all have seen this where, where Lifeway and Tom Rayner um, got into a situation to where Lifeway was going to sue or had filed a suit against Tom Rayner, who was the former president of that company. And thanks be to God that they came together and Tom Rainer came together back with the trustees of Lifeway to get that issue handled outside of court. And praise God for both parties coming to the table and being willing to put this principle into practice. Because could you imagine it was it was already seen as something crazy by those who were looking on to the situation. And that's what the world is saying is that y'all call yourselves Christians and y'all taking it, y'all supposed to, y'all are family, y'all are brothers and sisters, and y'all are taking each other to court over civil disputes? Paul says, bring that stuff to the church. See, this is why, this is why, this is one of the, one of the blights of American Western Christianity. For some of us, we become so individualized, so compartmentalized, so privatized that we, we do not see the blessing and the benefit of God's community. And we're supposed to be in community together, not just to give each other high fives and to smile at each other and to say, ain't God good. But it's supposed the church is there in part so that when we have issues like this, the church can get involved to keep us from going to secular courts. Oh, can I be can I be honest here? 
Can I be honest? You, you go to the secular court if you want to. Don't be crying when you get into financial straits because you went to the secular courts and they're burning a hole in your pocket if, because you, when you could have came to the church and got this situation resolved without having to spend, spend any money of your own. Yeah, yeah. Now, y'all don't want to talk to me. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> We go to court and you're complaining about lawyer fees and court fees and filing fees and all this stuff. And that's not the major reason, but that's a practical reason as to why you need to come to the church. There are, there are secondary benefits to us following God's instructions on bringing things to the church. Yeah. You can take stuff to the secular court if you want to. And they're going to be praying to the God that, who instructed you, talking about, God, I got these lawyer fees and I got this legal debt. Help me get out of debt. And God's like, you wouldn't have gotten into debt if you would have done it the way I told you to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'll, I'll give you grace and I'll help you pay it off. <laughs> I'll provide for you to pay it off. But don't do that. Brothers and sisters, that's, that's what we are called to do. There should be enough of us wise and mature in this body of believers that we are to be able to handle civil disputes that arise among us. Yep. Okay, I'm going to tell you, that's the reason why I, I need to move, but that's the reason why it's, it's a dangerous thing to try to deal with a Christian that's not connected to a local church. Mm. Mm. Come on now. <laughs> this ain't in my notes. I'm just saying. It's a dangerous thing to deal with a Christian who is a, who's a vagabond Christian, who's not submitted to any authority, not submitted to any elders, not submitted to any local church community. Because if you if you're dealing with them and you have a civil dispute with them and they are immature and they are not not growing in Jesus, it, it's going to get real ugly. This is the reason why we need to be connected to one another under pastoral, godly pastoral leadership, submitted to a local church so that and, and, and so that the church can know what's going on. Like you can be submitted to a church and be a member of a church, but if you're not, if you're not opening your life up and allowing God to help deal with some of the insecurities and maybe some of the issues you have with trust, you can be cutting off one of the means of God's grace in your life to deal with whatever situation you may be dealing with. Yep. Right. Nah, that's, nah, that's my stuff. I ain't going to bother the church about it. That's, I'm just going to deal with it my own way. Mm. I got some partners in the, in the legal field. I'm, I'm just going to deal with it in my way. God, it's like through Paul, man, bring that stuff to your local church. Let's hash it out here yeah. amongst our family of faith. I know that probably seems foreign yeah. when we hear this, but it's there in Scripture. Paul says that's the second way you need to bring those civil disputes. If you have a civil dispute between JP and myself or Tracy and myself or Cheryl and myself, if it's a local church issue, we need to bring it to the local church. Yeah. Right. Let us mediate this thing for you. So if I can make it practical, that means, if God forbid, any of us ever in here get a divorce. Mm hmm. Don't 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 run to the secular courts to try to help, let them deal with child support and all that kind of stuff. I know there's a place for that, but that bring that to the church. If you both are part of this church, let us try to help mediate that. So it, 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 it alleviates you having to sit through all of that. And, and sometimes that stuff a lot of times gets really bad. Again, it'll, just a practical point, it'll save you some money. <laughs> we, don't, we don't advocate for a divorce here, but we don't understand things happen. We get this, right? Things happen. Let the church help you. But unfortunately, in cases like that, people don't let us get a chance to help. They don't give us a chance to help. Because, you know, one person will leave and this one will stay and then go to, and then they just will, then they'll just, they'll just decide we're just going to go to the court and let the judge handle it. But then, but then, <laughs> listen, I'm not talking about those of y'all who tried to do that. I, I'm saying those that, that didn't try to do that. But then what happened, y'all, I've been in this game long enough. <laughs> then what happened is they'll come, one of the, one of the partners, the, the ex-spouses will come back to the church. Pray for us, Pastor. Pray for us, church, because we, we, we in this 
in battle. We are embattled in this raging war in the court. And a part of us sometimes, because we love you, sometimes it's like, why didn't you, why didn't you give us the chance? That maybe, maybe it wouldn't have gotten to that point. If you had given the church a chance, if y'all would have both humbled yourself and came under the care of your church and came under the care of your pastors or elders or leaders, we could have probably helped you and more than likely could have helped you through this in an amicable fashion. So here's the third and final way. How we should deal with civil grievances that may arise among us. Paul says Christians, uh, y'all, hear it, hear it. Christians should not seek, listen to the wording, Christians should not seek litigation over civil disputes against one another. Chris, I'm in the Bible, man. It's in verse 7 and 8. I want you to read it for yourself with me. Listen to Paul's words. To have lawsuits at all. Chase, did you hear that? Honey, did you hear that? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. You see where I get the point? Paul is saying Christians should not seek litigation over civil disputes against one another. He's, Paul is saying, listen, to have disputes or have lawsuits at all, it is already a spiritual defeat for you. You have already lost at the point of filing a lawsuit against one another, even before taking the issue to court and a verdict is rendered. It's right. You read it for yourself. Paul says to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat. In other words, the implication is it should not have happened at all. Brother or sister, you may win in court, but you have already lost before Christ. Um... I'm not saying, again, that, that, that there are never issues that force us to have to go to court against the fellow believer. That, that happens. But Paul is saying, listen, we should not seek to do it. We should not seek to do it. Um, the, way that I, the way that I explain this is Paul is basically saying, among fellow believers, particularly in the context of a local church, that you are both members of a local church, lawsuits, hear this, should be an undesirable last resort. Undesirable last resort. Taking each other to court, Daniel, over civil disputes should be approached, Danny, like, um, like you're having to go to a dentist office for a root canal. Not like you're taking a trip to Disney World. You get the... It's not like you should have joy and glee. Oh, we're going to see Mickey Mouse. We're going to see Minnie. Oh, I'm about to get, I'm about to get paid. I'm about to go. I'm about to get the Benjamins. I'm about to sue his tail off, her tail off. I'm set for life. I'm about to retire on this one. No, no. Paul is saying we should, we should go. As a last, we should go cautious. We should go almost like kicking and screaming that I, we did not want it to get to this point. So Paul asked two piercing questions as we get ready to bring this message to a close. Paul said, look at, look at verse 7. He says, listen, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? He said, why, why, 
for those of you that are, because in this case, a lot of times the, the person that would take uh, the believer to court was oftentimes the one who was more rich and powerful. Because the poor believer, the, the, the less po popular believer wouldn't go to court because they either didn't have the funds to or they knew that the odds were going to be stacked against them. And so Paul is saying, for those of you all that are taking the issue to court and you have the means to take it to court, he's saying, why not, why not y'all just, why not you just be, why don't you just take an L on this one? I mean, is it, is it, is the dispute going, is it going to hit, is it going to hurt you that bad for you not to get your book back? Is it going to hurt you that bad to not get that item that you let them borrow and they never gave it back to you? Is it going to really, is it going to really crater you that bad? Is it going to really put a dent in your livelihood that bad? Is it going to really hurt for you to go and get a Goodyear tire instead of Pirelli's? Yeah. I mean, God, he has given you a job and you can afford it. Are y'all trying? These are these are possibly believers who are who are well off. They are they have they have status. They have a good you know good income coming in. And he's saying, why not? Why why don't you just why don't you just be wronged? Why don't you take a why don't you take this for the team? Yeah. <laughs> he says, but verse eight, but you yourselves wrong and defraud, mm. even your own brothers. Mm. You know what this is going to do to your brother or sister if you take them into court. You know that they don't have the means to go into court to deal with this in court. Or you know what it's going to look like that if you put this case before the court, that you're going to have to, you're going to, have to put their character out on display before unrighteous people. That it's a, it's a contest when you go into the court. And you're going to have to put your opponent down. You're going to have to paint your opponent in the worst possible light to win this case. Why are you doing this to your family member? Why are you doing this to your brother or sister in Christ? Why would you want to subject your brother or sister to that? Are you not thinking? This is Paul. He is upset. He is like, are you not thinking what you are doing when you bring this issue before the court? You, why not take an L for the sake of your brother? Is it going to hurt you that bad? Yes, it may hurt your ego. Yes, it may hurt your pocketbook a little bit, but you'll recover. Yeah. But maybe they won't. Mm. Yeah. Maybe, they wanna, maybe they will drop out of the church. You don't know what this may do to their devotion to Jesus. Mm -hmm. yep. It may cause them to turn away from the church for decades upon decades upon decades because because. You took some small matter that could have been handled by the church to a secular judge, an unrighteous, unsaved judge. And did you not think that, yeah, you may have the means, but they may not have the means yep. to take care of all the costs that's going to come along with this? Not even talking about how their, their, their reputation is going to be drug in the mud, that their character is going to be questioned. You don't know what this is going to even do to their career. You don't, it may follow them in many ways that you haven't even thought about. Paul says, what? Why, not just, why not just take an L? You know what Paul is saying? He's saying we should, exhaust, we should exhaust every possible means to settle civil disputes among the church by the church. The, the court should be the last place that we have to go to get things settled and resolved. Exactly. We need to have a higher view of the church yeah. and the church's place in our lives as individual believers. Paul closes with this. Um, before I get to verse, verse 9, 10, 9 through 11, to close out the sermon, um, Paul doesn't say this, but it's in the context of the passages and the, the chapters we've read. Paul's concern here, you can only imagine that his concern, one of his major concerns is that suing each other, taking each other to court negatively affects our witness for Jesus. Like it, it, listen, listen, this, follow me. 
it doesn't show forth the glorious reconciling work of Jesus, that he has reconciled us back to God and to one another when we choose not to reconcile with one another in the context of the local church. It takes two to reconcile. I understand that. So I'm not, not blaming or condemning those of you that have tried, but it went another way. That's, that's not on you. But when we can, we ought to, in the local church, ought to both parties need to come together to try to reconcile this thing. Because if you take it to secular courts and it gets out there, it's going to be a black eye on your witness for Jesus. You'll call yourself Christians. And and some non-Christians be like, I never, I would never take my family member, a person that I consider to be a brother or sister, into court. You know, there used to be, there, there's some case, y'all know, I grew up, I grew up, I didn't grow up in the suburbs. My wife makes fun of me because she don't think no, there's no hoods in Austin, Texas, like there are in New York, but there are hoods in Austin, Texas, um, and she knows that. But, but I, you know, I, I grew up around uh, street cats, not, not meow cats. I'm talking about <laughs> people. You know what I'm saying? And they had a, um, it, was, it was like they had a code. You know what I'm saying? They had a code that, that you, you just didn't do certain things with your own. You didn't do certain things against your own. And, they, and, then, and then, you know, I'm not glorifying this, but there was a way that gangs did it. You know what I'm saying? That if, if a dude, if a gang member did something that was against the law, and they did something to kind of get the gang, you know, in the eyes of the, of the law, that they would handle that individual, not, not like, you know, kill and murder or anything, but they would jump them or, so, or they would do something to that individual so that they didn't have to take that issue or, or get taken, that, that issue getting taken to the, to the courts. They would deal with it. They would be like, you need to take that bike back, homie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, need to, you need to return, you know what I'm saying? They would be like, you need to go and make this thing right before the laws get involved. Because if the laws get involved, okay, some of y'all can't feel me because I know this ain't your life. Well, that wasn't your life. But if the law, and it wasn't my life either. I'm just saying, I knew people. I'm just saying, and it wasn't my life, Chris and Jackie. I, you know, I wasn't a gang member. I just knew people, right? <laughs> I just knew people. I was a church boy. I, you know, I went, went, okay, anyway. So, but I knew people. Y'all feel what I'm, and Paul is saying, we need to take care of this in the church because if the law gets to it, you get the point. This thing is going to get blown way out of proportion. And there's going to be more collateral damage than you want to have. So Paul ends this statement. He's saying, listen, verse 9, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, and I don't have time to get into all of these, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, listen, and such were some of you. Did you notice that in verse, verse 7 that in, or verse 8 that in some ways the, the certain believers were acting like pre-Jesus like their pre-Jesus state, like what he lists there. Remember, he says thieves. You see that? Greedy. And some of the reasons why these, these, some of these believers were going to court is because they were, they were being swindlers. That, that is a, that is a fraudulent activity. That's a, that's a con man or a con woman. And he's saying some of y'all are, are acting like that when it comes to these civil disputes. And Paul is saying, but you don't need to. Because such were some of you, but now you've been washed, spiritually cleansed. You've been sanctified. That is, you've been set apart for God and for his purposes. You have been justified. You have been declared right before God, not guilty before God because of Jesus. And he's saying you were that, so stop acting like that by taking each other to secular courts. You see Paul's point. 
Since all that the Son of God accomplished for you, he says in verse 11, the Spirit of God has now applied to your life. He said, now, because you are kingdom of God, you're a kingdom citizens, you need to live your life in that way when it comes to handling civil disputes. Don't act like you are not saved. Stop acting like you ain't saved and doing these things and defrauding your brother or sister and wronging your brother or sister and, and, and robbing from them and taking from them through the court system. Don't do that because that was you before Christ. But now that you are in Christ, you are redeemed. You are a new creation in Jesus. So drop the case. Drop the suit. Or go to the church and let the church mediate it. And Paul is not saying that you don't, you that never are to bring issues. And if you say you may have a legitimate cause, brother, sister, you may have a legitimate cause, and they need to give you the book back. <laughs> they need to go and get you a new tire. Absolutely. And Paul's saying, I'm not saying that you ought not to have that dispute. I'm saying how you ought to deal with that dispute. Yeah. Come before the church and let the church mediate that. And the church may even decide if they had the money to put in a couple of dollars so you can get an upgrade on your tire. Just to help y'all get over this hump. You ain't getting no Pirelli, but you... <laughs> Make sense? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for... Our time together, Lord, we pray that in these moments that we've been able to share, Lord, we are grateful to how your word, man, is so exhaustive. It is so comprehensive. Um, it covers so many areas of our lives. And Lord, I, I just want to pray again that, uh, that we don't tune this out. And I know for many of us, including myself, it may not be applicable right now in the moment, but that doesn't mean we don't need to learn it. That we don't need to learn what you've taught us today, that we don't need to embrace it, that we don't need to store it away because we never know when we may need this lesson for ourselves or you may use us to give counsel to someone else, to a fellow believer who may be contemplating certain decisions in their lives in relationship to another fellow believer. And God, when it comes to our, our Harvest family, Lord, if there ever are civil disputes among us, will you please give us the grace to open up our lives and to bring that issue before the, the pastors or the elders or mature believers in the Lord who can help them arbitrate, mediate the situation and come to a satisfactory resolution that pleases you and that is just and that is right in the eyes of those who have the dispute. Lord, we pray for those now who may have been watching this on live stream, for those that may be in the building who need to trust in you as Savior and Lord. Maybe they've never done that. We pray, Lord, you will lead them to repentance of sin, that they will see that they're sinners like us, that they'll see that you, that you created them in your image to be in a right relationship with them. But because of their sin, that relationship has been severed. But that's the reason why you sent Jesus to die on the cross for their sins, to live a perfect life and to be raised from the dead so that they will trust in Jesus. They can be made right with you, be forgiven of all their sins, have eternal life, have a, have a relationship with you and go to spend an eternity with all of us who have trusted in Jesus with you forever. Pray that you will lead them to make that decision today. For those who are believers who need to be baptized, Lord, they <clears throat> pray that you will help them to make that decision, Lord, that they will be obedient to you, Jesus that they will take a step of obedience and publicly identify with you through water baptism. And then there may be someone who was in the building or watching who wants to become a part of our local church. Lord, we ask that you will touch their hearts so that they will be obedient and they will join our, or begin to take the process to become a member of our church. We would love to, to be their church family, to be able to walk with them through this life together in honor of you and in Christ's name. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Pray you will bless our giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.